When you hear stories of neurodivergence, yet you can't find the ones that speak to your life. Utopia the Campaign aims to platform the voices of neurodivergence across different communities and life circumstances, so we find the words to get the support we need. Join me, Samantha Hugh, Director of ADHD Girls, as I uncover hidden stories of neurodivergence that come from a few, but speak to so many parts of our lives. So Sydney, um, we heard a lot about what your dad said about being a dad to you, you know, who newly diagnosed young adult with ADHD. And I know we talked before, you said that in school, despite being highly intelligent and identifying as someone who's gifted, internally, you knew that something was off with your life, but you blamed it on your poor habits. And it's difficult to know what it is, right? Especially when there isn't really enough awareness, as, as you said, about how ADHD presents in, in women. But as you have been privileged to have a father who is a psychologist, you know, who work with mental and behavioral health and support other families. Have you ever thought to discuss those challenges with him? Honestly, I, I never did. With the way ADHD presents in my life, I really felt, I, I never felt like there was a name for what I was experiencing. I thought it was just me. And I thought it was personality traits. And I thought it was, um, you know, the classes that I was taking or whatever workload I had. And I wasn't thinking about um, some of the other attributes associated to ADHD. I wasn't thinking about those as ADHD symptoms. Um, and I mostly wrote away a lot of those feelings. And I'm also a part of Gen Z. I'm 21 years old. And with Gen Z has come this beautiful emergence of mental health awareness. And... Also, a hyper-awareness, I think, in a lot of um, Gen Z adolescents, young adults, children. Um, for me, growing up, I was hyper-aware of mental health issues, and I was terrified of self-diagnosing. Um, I was terrified of being that girl who wanted to, you know, say, oh, I have this and that and whatever, and I don't really understand them, and it's invalidating people who do have these issues. Um, so I really didn't want to even sort of consider the possibility that I had ADHD because I was really scared of the self-diagnosing, um, I guess the stigma that comes with self-diagnosing, especially amongst Gen Z, Gen Alpha. So I, I genuinely, it wasn't on my radar at all. And thankfully, my public school ex experience, my grade school experience was phenomenal. Um, I went to a really very, very good public school, um, you know, kindergarten to, to 12th grade. Um, and the way that it was set up really worked with a neurodivergent brain a lot better than most traditional education. So... I took a lot of international baccalaureate classes and these classes are set up to be more about um, comprehension, being able to speak out what things mean, you know, talk through them, understand them, uh, work with hard concepts rather than sort of the AP side, which is memorization, you know, just filling out filling out facts on a sheet sort of thing. So I really had a, an incredible experience in grade school, which sort of worked well with my brain and there were less issues. My grades were great during grade school. Um, and it wasn't until I really went to university and the classes were not set up like this, you know, 300, 500 students in one lecture hall with one professor sitting at the front talking for two hours. It's not great for a neurodivergent brain. It's definitely not great for an ADHD brain. Um, and I really, I mean, I had that experience of leaving home and leaving grade school where I had a lot of structure and a lot of support to a world where I was a thousand miles away from my family. And I 
knew nobody and I didn't understand how to navigate college. I didn't understand how to study correctly. I didn't understand how to manage my time correctly. And I put air quotes and manage my time because it's something that's borderline impossible. I feel with ADHD, there's no such thing as being able to, you know, compartmentalize correctly and give weight to all the tasks correctly and get everything done correctly. So I was experiencing procrastination, which I hate to call procrastination because procrastination to me has always had a very negative connotation Mm -hmm. and it's always been told to me from teachers, parents, et cetera, oh, you're procrastinating on assignment, you know, don't procrastinate, you know, et cetera. Um, And I've never consciously thought that I was a procrastinator. Uh, I just did my work very quickly (laughs) right before deadlines. Uh, I didn't really think that I needed to get things done over a long period of time. And the thought really never crossed my mind that I was consciously procrastinating. Um, I actually saw a really interesting interview and I, I blanked on the, the interviewee, but she explained ADHD as sort of a nearsightedness of the brain. So mm-hmm. most neurotypical people have perfect vision. You can see everything out in front of you and calculate everything that is in your way, sort of calculate the steps that are, you're needing to take to get to places um, or to understand things. You're able to read science and far away. And people with ADHD really have a nearsighted brain. So everything else that neurotypicals can see from 10 miles away or 10 feet away, neurodivergence can see from, you know, 10 inches away, 10 centimeters away. Um, And it only really exists until it's right up in front of you. So that's kind of my experience, like with schoolwork is the, the assignments and the tests and the quizzes and the essays didn't exist until they were right here up in front of me. And it was the due date was now. Um, yeah. This was the now, not not now thing, isn't it? And yeah. I know you say about nearsightedness. I find that this can apply to our executive function, you know, but like in terms of like seeing big picture, we can see far, can't we? <laughs> seeing details. So I, I want to really dig deep about, you know, this uh, Fast Company article that you appeared in. And in it, it said that you are a strong student at school. But then when you went to university, you know, you struggled with getting to lectures and finding it difficult to focus, you know, which is completely understandable and landing in somewhere of an alien land, you know, from D.C. to Utah is quite different. And I actually really want to find out, you know, from you about your perception of being, you know, someone with ADHD, but also identifying as being gifted and very intelligent, you know, because we know intelligence has nothing to do with our, you know, um, neurodiversity or our neurodivergence. You know, we can have this developmental conditions, neurodevelopmental conditions and still, you know, be really clever because it's almost like a different part of the brain. You know, like, were you ever assess for high intelligence you know and therefore sort of took it upon yourself you know this is where I'm gonna go now you know this is me um good question I I was never formally assessed for uh high intelligence or being a gifted student I I think in grade school I was sorted into the you know the gifted class I was with the kids who could read at 12th grade level you know at eighth grade and um I've always been really strong in reading writing things like that because they were so abstract and I was able to really translate how I was thinking in a way that made sense to me. Whereas in the math and sciences, you have to go through a very specific path. And that was really challenging for me. Um, It still is challenging. Math and science is not my thing. Um, So I was never formally assessed, but I do find it so frustrating knowing material and understanding concepts and performing terribly in classes. Um, I just, I can be so tuned in to what's going on and really struggle to translate that into grades. Um, And a lot of that is just based on the structure. A lot of it is based on a very antiquated sense of, you know, traditional education system um, that has a very specific narrow path. 
Right. Like, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think because I, I've heard from your dad that, you know, they'll be going to bed and they'll still see you, you know, up at 2 a.m., you know, trying to, like, uh, do, do the schoolwork. <laughs> and then, you know, they never really saw that as something that you had to do to catch up, you know, or to actually just, you know, put in the extra amount of effort to achieve certain result. You also mentioned burned out, you know, while trying to channel all that you've got to achieve those grades. Um, and and so, like, you know, this, this burnout, what were your coping strategies before you got to that level? I've really struggled with, uh, you know, the sense of perfectionism. Um, being very hard on myself about grades and that pressure never came from my parents thankfully uh, but it's always come from me and it's just been recently the past year and a half two years where I've tried to take more of a back seat and understand you know my grades don't define me at all um, I can get jobs and I can you know perform well in society and I can hold conversations well without you know getting an A in statistics or philosophy um so I've done my best to try to lower the amount of importance that it has in my life, um, which has definitely been challenging and I'm not there yet. But in terms of like habits or skills that I picked up, um, I always have gotten very frustrated by people who have said, oh, big ADHD tip, just use a planner, uh, just use a calendar. <laughs> and I'm like, no, those don't work at all for me. I'm sure they probably work for somebody. But for me, they just don't. They're so, nothing makes sense about a planner for me. Um, I I get way too focused on what color each day of the week is going to be and what stickers I'm going to use. And I hyper-focus on it for two days. And then I close the planner and never open it again. Um, and I have no idea what's going on in my life. So for me, honestly post-it notes like sticky notes on my wall has been a big help for me because they're garish and they're hard to look at and I see them every time I'm in my room um and it's just you know my to-do list items this essay is due tonight you know go to this doctor's appointment and when my task is done I get to, get to take it off the wall so I I found like little hacks for myself um just from trial and error really so sticky notes um creating rituals um, I always light a candle before I do homework. So whenever I light a candle, my brain tells me it's homework time. Um, oh. yeah, I, I try to make my spaces as fluid and comfortable for myself as I can. I basically try to set myself up with the best circumstances possible before I attempt to tackle any of the work, because if I attempt to tackle any of the work or even think about tackling any of my work before my surroundings are correct <laughs> um it's not gonna happen I, I get very overwhelmed I do a lot of cleaning before I need to do <laughs> homework I clean my room I go clean my house you know clean my laundry room or I don't know do something random vacuum the couch um go clean forever and I like to get makeup put my makeup on before I do work because it makes me feel professional um mm -hmm. Yeah, a bunch of weird things that I feel like never come up in the, yeah. the listicles. <laughs> and, and, and they work for you, right? You know, I think um, perfectionist tendency that you talk about is, is very common, you know, especially as we've had to try so much harder than everyone else to, you know, to achieve the same result that other people do. And, you know, what I found is throughout your your life, I mean, I, I think now because you're in university, you know, what, what it is like, this is not something people really grow out of. You know, and I think, like, eventually find a way to to kind of just get a job done instead of trying to achieve perfection, because the cost to get there, you know, is so much on the brain, you know, so overwhelming on the ADHD brain. Like, it's not sustainable. For, Absolutely. I mean, for I think the best examples, I, I'm a very strong writer and I really love writing, but I think every single writing assignment I've ever had, I've bitten off so much more than I can chew and so much more than what I was asked because I'm genuinely really interested in whatever subject which is usually some very difficult concept and you know the paper is five pages long I'm like I can't I can't get my thoughts out in less than 10 I need yeah. to write for you know 
24 hours straight. Like I have all these great ideas. And then I end up not getting a good grade on it because I didn't follow, you know, conventions correctly. I didn't do the page count right. I took way more than I needed to take on um, because I, I just get really passionate and really excited. And for the work that I excel in, it's things that I really, really love. But that can be very limiting because I don't love everything, <laughs> especially, yeah. especially with education. Um, there are a few assignments, but the ones I do love, I end up just throwing way too much time into. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that's so interesting. And also about what you're studying, you know, sociology. Well, I, I'm so interested in that as well, especially community psychology and, and, and how societies organize. And I think in our conversation, you said something about having this interest in sociology and intersectionality. Can you tell me what role intersectionality plays in conversations regarding disability and neurodiversity? I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, because I can talk about this for hours and hours. Oh, I love it. <laughs> but... Um, I mean, with intersectionality, you really have to, and intersectionality with ADHD, obviously you're looking at um, disability, ability, uh, class, race, gender, et cetera. Um, and I think class is huge with ADHD because it is very expensive and very, very difficult to get tested for ADHD. And in order to get medication, at least in the United States, it's a class two federally protected um, drug. And it's it's really challenging. Sometimes pharmacies run out of the amount of stimulant medication they can give you. So even if I have a prescription, I can go to my pharmacy and they say, sorry, we're all out of Adderall. And I don't, where am I supposed to get it then? Um, so of course you have this, this aspect where um, you do need at least a solid chunk of money to get started. Um, and you can self-diagnose, but self-diagnosing isn't going to get you medication. It's not going to get you accommodations. It's not going to get you help with the, um, like it's, you're not going to get very much support with that. Um, so of course you have this piece on top of it. Um, and then the process in itself is very difficult for an ADHD brain to get done. Um, of course, as I'm coordinating all the testing at Disney Behavioral Health, I try to make it as ADHD friendly as physically possible. Um, I do everything over email, so it's easy to come back to. I have everything. I have my important things bolded. I have things highlighted, underlined. Everything's, you know, in sections. And I'm often talking to people on the phone uh, because I understand that it's really overwhelming and really, really challenging. And I don't know if I would have been tested. I actually am, I would say I'm probably 95% confident that I would have never been tested if it weren't for my dad and having that free resource. Um, obviously, my dad didn't charge me to get an ADHD test done and it's it's in his office I mean I I went home one day and I brought up oh I think I don't know I might have ADHD but probably not like maybe we'll get tested but like it's okay if you don't have time whatever thankfully he's like oh I have an hour let's go to the office you know okay it's fine if you don't want to, you know and then all of a sudden I have ADHD um so of course you have class on top of it uh, of with this and and the wealth the wealth gap especially in the United States the wealth gap is is really um bizarre it's absurd it's extreme um and there are very very few social resources um and government funded resources everything is privatized and i just wish i could change the american healthcare system <laughs> but i can't um i can't like this but maybe i can do something so you have this and then with gender um adhd has been a male diagnosis for ever since it was noticed until 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, obviously there were women who were diagnosed with ADHD, but it was, it was a male diagnosis. It was a male condition. Boys have ADHD. Little girls don't have ADHD, uh, which really gets into the way gender is societally constructed um, and why we see certain traits as being gendered, like hyperactivity. Um, so growing up like I didn't with ADHD a lot of the times for little boys it's positive qualities it's you know he's so active he's gonna be so athletic so sporty he's such a good leader he's so good at talking he can command a room um etc and with girls it's 
space cadet, you know, in her head, That's daydreaming, right. gossiping, you know, overly sensitive, PMSing, oh. um, like you can That's go cool. on and on. Yeah. But there aren't the positives that are there for little boys with ADHD are not there for little girls with ADHD. And I think it's getting better, but we have a long ways to go. Um, and then of course you have race on top of everything and ethnicity, culture, etc. There are I get so many emails every single day from people who are first generation immigrants, second generation, third generation immigrants to the United States and they're saying, you know, I'm I'm 45 years old. We've never had this kind of conversation at home. We've never discussed ADHD. It's never been a part of my culture. I've always, you know, been told like, it's not there. It's not real. It's fine. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, get, get through life. And I have, that's the most heartwarming thing, especially working with adults who are getting diagnosed very late. Um, it's, it's just, it's sad, but I'm glad that I'm there and I'm glad that they're, you know, moving forward. And, and so of course you have, you know, culture and identity and ethnicity and, and race on top of everything. So, I mean, really the people who are getting diagnosed and getting the resources they need are, are white middle-class upper-class men. Um, it's not lower-class people at all. Um, it's, it's usually people who are upper to middle-class, um, usually men and usually white i mean that's that's who comes out on top nine times out of ten uh and, and it's the, the same the same can be said for adhd mm, yeah completely you know it's privilege you know so it's the way society organized itself you know so to favor the research done in people they you know like who who call the shots and you know and, and people who you know want to find help for certain group of uh, individuals and you know women's health is so under researched and underfunded and you mentioned class divide as well you know the social identity of somebody from a socially disadvantaged background you know who may not even have the words to you know say what they are feeling and not know anything about some of these more fancy psychological you know conditions that we know and when they go to a doctor, often like I've heard stories of people being gaslit and, and you know told to go away because I oh, don't don't be silly, you, know, you don't have that, you know. But a lot of the time, the GP, the, the general practitioner, don't even have any awareness, you know, or in depth knowledge about it. And so it's funny that the women in my community um, have a free WhatsApp community, and and they're just saying today how, you know, like just go into your appointment with your GP and just you know, have that mindset that you know more than they do, you know, and, and that's not said in arrogance, that that's more said in, you know, defiance to the system, and having to find your own way, you know, and they're so resourceful, and there's so many different places that they could get, you know, information from, and, and, and resources from, because we've had to, right, and, and what you mentioned about PMSing, the hormones, my god, you know, that is another area that is so under-researched, under-funded, and under-supported, and I mean, me now, you know, in my 40s, figuring out what is going on with my, is it perimenopause or am I just living a stressful lifestyle? Because, mm -hmm. you know, like, I, I'm sure you've come across that, you know, the impact of estrogen on um, the ADHD brain. You know, that um, the, the curve is interesting because I think like in the women's reproductive years, estrogen is quite high, quite steadily. And then as you get older, it starts to lower and then the curve is like up and down up and down up and down for about 10 years you know and it's just like it's not even tied to your monthly cycle anymore you just don't know like am I just going batshit crazy or you know is there an yeah. explanation for this yeah what is happening and why does why doesn't anybody tell me what's going on <laughs> yeah why is everything so expensive yeah completely yeah. so you know, I really appreciate that you know someone like you now within the clinics you know actually talking to the patient and you know uh, trying to f help them find their way yeah. um, and set in an accessible way as well and you know and, and you obviously care a lot for this cause you know who knows you mm -hmm. might you know find a way to merge your sociology you know in interest with uh, yeah. helping people because uh, well, hopefully yeah yeah 
do you agree you have that social justice like kind of uh, you know tendency like you want to yeah. do something, like... I mean, absolutely I mean I was raised in in DC like I was raised going to the protests I was wow. you know doing walkouts at school like I was completely immersed in that and I also was like this is just normal this is what normal people stand for <laughs> like this is just the good thing to do um and then I moved to Utah which is a very very conservative um mm. very religious state and it is very challenging <laughs> to be here it's ranked one of the lowest states in the country for um women <laughs> like livelihood yeah. women um yeah it's it's very patriarchal antiquated oh very very traditional values um mm -hmm. so you know I moved here and I was more just confused I was like this is not the 50s how are we still talking like this what's going on um which wow. is part of the reason why I went into sociology because I my thought process was okay sociology is gonna be where the cool students are it's for the students who are not crazy they're gonna be there and I'm for gonna find students. some normal professors exactly who are good people <laughs> and I'm gonna like feel comfortable um you know speaking my truth speaking my mind in these types of classes and then I you know took a sociology class fell in love um but yeah it is really really interesting and I've, I've had pretty good luck in terms of working with professors, um, in terms of accommodations, things like that. But something that just is really, there's just not enough education out there. There's just not enough resources about what ADHD is and what it looks like. And of course it is a spectrum. And of course there are people who are going to deal with much lessened intensity of symptoms and then people who deal with a much higher intensity of symptoms but something that's just always really troubled me is I will go to professors you know okay I have I have seven quizzes that I haven't done over you know these two months sorry like I just haven't done them and almost feeling like I have to lie to make up a better excuse for why I can't get my things done or make up some sort of better excuse for why my performance is the way it is. Because if I just said I have ADHD, it's okay. So you get distracted sometimes, get your work done, you know, like, it, so, you know, it'll be times where I'm like, Oh, you know, sorry, I didn't get back to you, whatever. I, I was in California for a week because I had to attend a funeral. Like I, had to, I just like feel like I had to yeah, make things up. I do. Yeah. It's, completely especially sick. with, um just rejection sensitivity dysphoria I know my dad touched on it I am quite sensitive um the thought of people being disappointed in me or me being at fault has always caused such anxiety um mm -hmm. so going to a professor and saying like and being vulnerable and saying this is what I'm dealing with these are the cards that I have this is what we're doing I need some support like that has just been so terrifying um, which is also probably another reason why I didn't really go to my dad ever before I, you know, sort of came home and mentioned it to him. Um, yeah. because I just want to be able to do it. I just want to be able to do things. And I, I really get frustrated with myself when I'm not able to do the things that I see my peers doing. Yeah, no, completely. I, 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 I get it, you know, completely. And yeah. it's like you guys have got a great relationship, you know, he's obviously very doting on you and you know loves you and and, and yeah you, you you seem to share it this bond and you know like so there's just just living you know with with ADHD and I know you're 21 now you know you have the world ahead of you you know and um you know so much already about ADHD and you are very um aware of the intersectional side of things you know what message would you give, you know, healthcare professionals in the future around diagnosis and support for not just girls and women, but also other cultural, you know, and when you add the ethnicity lens to it as well? I think the strongest thing I could say is get educated, learn as much as you can. Um, 
work with people who know more than you and go from there. I, like you can't get anything done if you have a very antiquated version of ADHD in your brain. If you think ADHD is, you know, the little boy condition where you're bouncing off walls and yeah, if, if that's what you think ADHD is, is you're, you're not going to be of service to anybody looking for ADHD services. Um, and I think the same can be said across all of society with all disabilities and marginalizations, you know, knowledge is power. Um, both healthcare professionals, like, find resources that are easily accessible and that are easily digestible and that can be pursued by people who may have ADHD or other neurodivergencies because it can be really hard to understand where to go for help. So if you have the resources, make them public, put flyers up, talk to other people, put your referrals out, make it easy on your website to find, like make the process simple, as simple as possible. Um, I know there is obviously a scare with prescribing medication um, because you don't want to overprescribe medication, obviously. But the effect, it's worse for people who have ADHD to not get their medication than it is for people without ADHD to get medication. Um, there are no studies that show some long-term severe negative consequences of people abusing Adderall. Obviously, don't abuse medication. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But it's better to play it safe and get the, your diagnoses out because even if you think somebody might look a little bit shady or your, your biases are coming out and you think maybe they're looking into this for the wrong reasons, they're just trying to get medication, whatever, mm-hmm. you don't know what's going on. And you don't know the people that you're, that you're testing or that people that you're um, caring for and you don't know their backgrounds. And if you're using objective measures to test for ADHD, you either have it or you don't. So mm-hmm. you might as well push the resource out there, get tested, get diagnosed. If you even think about it, get diagnosed. It's not going to hurt you. Um, it's probably going to help you more likely than not. Um, there's no reason why it should be this kind of hidden secret of how to get tested for ADHD. So that, that would be my sort of thing. Well, thanks, Sydney. That's really insightful. And you're really clever. You know, you've you touched on some really good points. And also from the aspect of this experience as well, you know, accessibility is such a huge thing, because not everyone has the knowledge or, you know, the money to access and making things, you know, as easy as possible for people to get, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely the way forward. But, you know, in terms of funding, you know, that's still a, a story lacking. So, you know, there are a lot of people out there who want to do good, but there is just very little money in it. And they had to, you know, just make a choice between like, do I work on my livelihood or do I help people? Right. And, and so and that's why, you know, we need more more funding for public health services for um, not just ADHD, but neurodivergence as well. So thank you for, you know, spending this time with me with this interview. You know, you, you've been a great um, person to chat to and, and so energetic and, and, and lovely, you know, because it can feel good, good vibes throughout. What did you think of this episode? If it resonates with you, do share it so we can empower other neurodivergence too. We want to open up conversations for neurodivergence across all communities, especially the ones who are underrepresented so they can get diagnosed and find the support they need in life and work. I'm Samantha Hugh, Director of ADHD Girls, and you can invite me to speak at your organization or subscribe to my upcoming bite-sized video courses on ADHD and neurodiversity via a new learning platform called Utopia. You can find the link via my link tree within my bio on Instagram and LinkedIn. Special thanks to QB Tech for being such a wonderful collaborator throughout phase one of this campaign.